Hey guys, welcome to Bible V by V, where we study the Bible verse by verse on various topics. My name is Gray, and today I'll be talking with you about giants. Many of us grew up knowing about the story of uh, David and Goliath. We know that Goliath was a giant, but most of us don't know how tall he was or whether or not he was some freak anomaly. So let's go over some subjects uh, to, I mean, let's go over some scriptures to talk about this subject. Uh, let's start with Genesis 6, 1 through 4. It says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days will be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were men of old men, old men of renown. It says that the giants became mighty men in the past that were famous. The word giants here is not the Hebrew word for giants. It is Strong's H5303 Nephil, meaning the Nephilim, which means the fallen ones. We see this word used only one other time in the Bible. In Numbers chapter 30, uh, 13, 33, it says, And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. In these two verses, we read about the famous Nephilim of the past. Could this be who the Greeks and Romans considered gods? People like Zeus, Hera, Poseidon, Hades, and Apollo? When we look at the history of these gods, it is surrounded with sexual actions, mighty offspring, and extremely tall people. So how tall could they have gotten? In Amos 2.9 it says, Yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height was as the height of the cedars, and he was strong as the oaks, yet I destroyed his fruit from above, and his roots from beneath. Did you know that cedar trees can grow up to 150 feet tall? Does this mean that the Amorites could have been the ancient gods and titans of the past? Again, we read in Numbers 13.33, And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in their own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. If the spies were an average of about six feet tall, and they were like grasshoppers in the sight of Anak, imagine how big these giants really were. It would take a lot of food for these giants to eat. Uh, this may be one of the reasons why the gods required sacrifices from the people. We read in Numbers 13.23, And they came into the brook of Eshgal, and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bare it between two of them on a staff, and they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. These grapes, pomegranates, and figs had to be giant in size so the giants could fill their appetite. Let's take a look at some of the giants that are found in the Bible. In Strong's H7497, Rapha is translated as giants or Rephaim. The Rephaim are mentioned after the flood, and any time Rephaim is used, you know that it's talking about giants. So here's some references. In Genesis 14.5, and in the fourteenth year came Jadorlaomer and the kings that were with him, and smote the Rephaims in Ashtaroth, Karnaim, and the Zuzims in Ham, and the Ammons in Shava, Kirathim. In Second Samuel 5.18, the Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. At first glance, it doesn't seem like this word means much, but when you look at the root, it's talking about giants being in the land. The valley of Rephaim is between the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea, and it's just west of Jerusalem and north of Hebron. Sometimes the word Rapha is translated as giants instead of Rephaim. In Deuteronomy 2, 10 through 11, it says, The Emons dwelt there in the past, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims, which also were accounted giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites called them Emons. Also in verses 20 and 21, that also was accounted a land of giants. Giants dwelt therein in old time, and the Ammonites called them Zamzumans, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims. But the Lord destroyed them before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their steed. These texts are telling us that the Raphaim are also called Emims, 
Anakims and Zamzamans. Let's look at Emans first. Strong's 368, Emim means terrors. They are mentioned twice in Deuteronomy 2 and once in Gen Genesis 14.5. Strong's H6062, Anakai, means long-necked. They are mentioned nine times throughout Deuteronomy and Joshua. Here in Deuteronomy 128 it says, Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, The people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the son of Anakins there. We know that not only were they tall, but they built cities that were extremely tall, reaching into heaven. This is similar to what Nimrod tried to accomplish with the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11.4. As for the Zamzamans, Strong's H2157, Zamzam means plotters and is only mentioned once in Deuteronomy 2.20. Let's look at a little bit more about the Anakims. It says in Deuteronomy 9.2, A people great and tall, the children of the Anakims, whom you know, and of whom you have heard say, who can stand before the children of Anak? So the Anakims were the sons of Anak. Joshua 15, 13 through 14 says, And unto Caleb the son of Jephunneh he gave a part among the children of Judah, according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, even the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which city is Hebron. The, and Caleb drove thence the three sons of Anak, Shishai, Ahiman, and Talmai, the children of Anak. So here we learn that Arba is Anak's father, and Shishai, Ahiman, and Talmai are the sons of Anak. So we have several giants here with their names given. There are other giants whose names are mentioned as well. Og, king of Bashan, is Strong's 5747 Og, which means long-necked. Deuteronomy 311. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabbath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits was the breadth thereof, after the cubit of a man. So how tall was Og? If a cubit is 18 inches, which is a generously small amount, then he probably was about 13 and a half feet tall. In Deuteronomy 3.13, And the rest of Gilead and all Bashan, being the king of Og, gave I unto the half-tribe of Manasseh, all the region of Argob, with all Bashan, which was called the land of giants. So it seems that everyone in Bashan was a giant. Also in Joshua 9.10, And all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond Jordan, to Sihon, king of Heshbon, and to Og, king of Bashan, which was at Ashtaroth. Og was the king of the Amorites. The Amorites were against the children of Israel often throughout the history. Also, Sihon, who was king of the Amorites, is also often mentioned alongside of Og. Perhaps he was a giant as well. We come to the next giant whose name is Goliath. Strong's 1555 says Goliath means splendor. 1 Samuel 17, 4-7 And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like the weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed six hundred shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. If a cubit is eighteen inches, again, and the span is nine inches, then that would put Goliath at about ten feet tall. Let's look at another giant by the name of ish ben -Binab. This is Strong's H3430. Yishbal ben means his dwelling is in Nob. He is the son of Rapha, one of the nations of the Philistine giants who attacked David in battle and was slain by Abishai. 2 Samuel 21.16 And Ish-Ben-Benob, which was of the sons of the giant, the, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he, being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. We read about Saph in 2 Samuel 21:18, And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sivakai the Hushathite slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giant. Strong's H5593, calf means tall. One of Goliath's brothers was named Lami. 1 Corinthians 20, verse 5, And there was war again with the Philistines, and Elhanan, the son of Jair, slew Lami, the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, whose spear 
staff was like a weaver's beam. There was also an unnamed, unknown giant mentioned in 2 Samuel 21, 20 through 21. And there was yet a battle in Gath, and there was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers, and on his foot six toes, four and twenty-four in number, and he was also born of the giant. And when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shammai, the brother of David, slew him. This is interesting because it mentions that he has six fingers and six toes on each hand and foot, respectively. It also, it has also been said that he probably had two rows of teeth as well. There is also another unknown giant in 1 Chronicles 11.23, and he, Benini, slew an Egyptian, a man of great stature, five cubits high, and in the Egyptian's hand was a spear like a weaver's beam, and he went down to him with a staff and plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear, That's similar to David when he killed Goliath with his own sword. Again, if a cubit is 18 inches, this would put this Egyptian at about seven and a half feet tall. We also learn about groups of people uh, like the Perizzites in Joshua 17:15, and Joshua answered them, "If you be a great people, then get you up into the wood country and cut down for yourself there in the land of the Perizzites of the giants, if Mount Ephraim be too narrow for you." It would seem that the Perizzites are giants, according to this scripture and the next one in Deuteronomy 7:1. It says, When the Lord your God shall bring you into the land where you go to possess it, and have cast you out many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you. It would actually seem that all seven of these nations were more than likely giants. And this would mean that the children of Israel were surrounded by giants throughout their history. So how do we explain these giants? Where did they come from? How did they get here? Let's try to look at what the text tells us in the Bible. It is possible that angels who forsook their spiritual bodies took on physical bodies to mate with women who gave birth to these giant hybrids. If that sounds strange, then consider some of these scriptures. Jude 1, 6-7 And the angels which kept not their first estate a state but left their own habitation he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day even as sodom and gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh and set forth an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire why does it say in like manner what does that even mean the people of sodom and gomorrah committed fornication uh, in the act of homosexual sin, which was in like manner to the fornication of the angels who made it with women. The text seems to tell us that the, the act of sin that the people in Sodom and Gomorrah participated in is similar or in like manner to that of what the angels took part in. Again, in 2 Peter 2, 4 through 6, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. Here, the angels who committed fornication are connected with what happened in Noah's time in Sodom and Gomorrah. It says they sinned, but not how. So Peter references the days of Noah and what God did to Sodom and Gomorrah to compare how the angels sinned. This is a subject that we need to pay close attention to and to take seriously. What happened in the days of Noah before the flood will be similar to that what, with what happens to us when Jesus comes back or before he comes back. In Matthew 24, 37 through 39, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the son, coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came, and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So it mentions specifically that they were marrying and giving in marriage. This is probably a reference to what the fallen angels were doing with the women. 
Some may say that angels can't have sex with women, and they quote the scripture from Matthew 22:30, which says, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. This text describes how the good angels don't fornicate or even marry, but any restriction God has, the demons will defy it. If God says not to do something, we can definitely expect that the demons or fallen angels will do the same thing. Let's look back and examine the text found in Genesis chapter 6. In verse 1 and 2, it says basically this, And it came to pass when men, all people born of Adam, began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God, which are the fallen angels, saw the daughters of men, of Adam, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Verses 4 and 5, there were giants, which is really everyone from Adam to Noah, and the earth in those days, and also after that, after the flood, there was also giants. When the sons of God, angels, came into the daughters of men, Adam, and they bare children, which were giant hybrids to them, the same became mighty men, which were amalgamations or demigods which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Do we live in an evil world today? Is it so evil that God is ready to destroy it with fire, like he did in the past when he destroyed the earth with water? The answer is no. The world is not overcome with evil that is comparable to that time before the flood. The amount of evil that existed before the flood was so great that God had to wipe out life from the earth. We are currently not there yet. It won't be long before the hearts of men are continually evil on the earth though. They will splice animal DNA with human DNA. Fallen angels may even decide to mate with women again which would cause giants to return to the earth. So let me ask you this. Could you tolerate such evil on this earth? Could you tolerate the evil acts of fallen angels with men in the next few years? The answer is probably yes, since over the past 100 years we have been bombarded with films, TV shows, and advertisements that talk about giants, and they want to encourage us to like them a lot more. All this has been strategically done so that we can tolerate what's about to happen. So let's look over the past hundred years at just a few examples of giants being introduced into our culture. In 1928, we see the introduction of the Green Giant. In 1957, there was a movie called The Amazing Colossal Man. This was followed by The War of the Colossal Beast in 1958. That same year, the attack of the 50-foot woman came out. Also, the Smurfs were uh, introduced to us in that year, which puts humans taller than the Smurfs. Uh, again, with the same concept, in 1995, we're introduced to the Indian in the cupboard, which has a shrunken human in it. In 1999, we're introduced to the Iron Giant. In 2000, we see Toru in the Jackie Chan Adventures television series. In 2001, The Lord of the Rings came out, which featured giant statues. In 2007, in the Bridge of Terabithia, we saw a large giant. In 2009, we were introduced to Avatar. In 2010, we see the giant gods of, in the story of Percy Jackson. In 2011, the film Thor showed us the frost giants. In 2011, there was a TV show called Once Upon a Time, which featured a giant. In 2013, the old story of Jack and the Beanstalk comes to life with Jack the Giant Slayer. And it is projected in 2015 for the movie Ant-Man to come out, who can increase his size to a giant stature. All these films and more have brought giants back into the mind of the public. So, what's the reason? Why all this influence about giants? I believe it is to help us tolerate what is about to happen in the near future. Well, I hope you've enjoyed my video on giants, and I look forward to studying the Bible with you again verse by verse.